what do they want? Are we about to come face to face with them, whether we're ready or not? Find out from the world's leading experts in this very special edition of Raiders Live News Talk Radio. You're listening to RNN Radio, where thinking people tune in. And this is the Raiders Live News Talk Radio Show. I am your host, Thomas Horn, and am, as always, joined in the studio tonight by that expert in all things equestrian herself, Nita, and that guitar assassinating wild man of the Ozarks, Joe Artis. Hey, hey. And we welcome you back to the special edition of Raiders Live News Talk Radio on the timely subject, Official Disclosure, Prepare for Contact. Now, in this segment... We're talking to Colonel Jesse Marcel, Jr. Jesse says publicly and in his book that the famous UFO event near the city of Roswell actually occurred, including the recovery of an extraterrestrial craft. Colonel Marcel's father, Major Jesse Marcel, Sr., was the lead military investigator into the crash of 1947. And so we're going to ask him all about that story and the evidence and his book from somewhere now, maybe still buried in snow this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to this segment of Official Disclosure, Prepare for Contact, Colonel Jesse Marcel, Jr. Good evening, Jess. Well, good evening. Good to talk with you. Hey, it's great to talk to you again, too. And and what about that question about the snow? Well, you know, we haven't had any snow for a few days now, and the outside temperature is, is in the 40s, actually. So this is one of our warmest days since last November. Wow, and 40s so make you want to go snow. sunbathing. We still have about a foot of snow in the yard, though, but uh, it's, it's going away a little bit, but we expect more later. <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, well, that's a lot better than when you told me you had to hustle it back out there to shovel more snow, so I'm oh, happy yeah. for you. <laughs> uh, we got a lot of co- uh, territory to cover tonight. We want to talk about Roswell, of course. Uh, one other thing before we get to Roswell, uh, part of the reason why the Royal Society was meeting this last week is that we are also approaching the anniversary um, of the day in April 1960 when Frank Drake, who was an astronomer at Cornell University, formed his uh, famous Drake equation, and he kick-started the SETI program, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. Now, we interviewed your good buddy, Stanton Friedman, and I think he refers to that as uh, something like silly search for it, <laughs> something like that. Uh, I want to ask you what you think about SETI, and also, uh, do you know anything about um, Drake's equation? Well, you know, uh, Stan and I kind of differ on, on our viewpoint of SETI. As a matter of fact, I'm looking on that computer right now, and they do have a screensaver, SETI at home, which uh, is screening signals from the Air Civil Telescope. And I'm watching this as they're coming in at this moment. And, uh, and I think it's good, you know, because it just, it's a, just another um, tool or in our information-gathering process of extraterrestrial life. Even though we know it's there, you know, Stan thinks it's just a waste of money, but <clears throat> I think it, it isn't because I think it, like I said, it just uh, adds more wheat to the chaff here. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, go ahead. So I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm oh. going to say uh, I'm in favor, you know, the Seth Shostak program there with Frank Rake and his equation, his very famous equation of, of uh, how many years ago it is, as it is now, but uh, uh, his equation might be rather conservative, as a matter of fact. I think a lot of people believe that it is conservative. It was 50 years ago, and uh, on the one hand, you know, he concluded that there might be something like uh, 10,000 habitable universes, but then when you start talking about how many uh, billions of planets that there might be out there, it would be like finding a needle in a haystack. Um, But whether he's right or not, I don't know. And there are uh, people who are um, just as credible as he is and equally qualified who think that the chances might be much greater than that. Now, you're the only man alive, Jess, who the government admits handled material from the debris field in 1947, Uh, material that your dad let you and your mom see, right? Tell us that story. Take us back there and tell us what happened. Well, my dad was the intelligence officer for the uh, 
uh, Roswell Army Airfield, which uh, at that time was home base to the 509th Bomb Group, which uh, helped end the war with the uh, nuclear bombing of, uh, of Japan. And my dad was uh, really intricately in, in that area there. And uh, as the intelligence officer, it's his job to uh, investigate any uh, facts of uh, aircraft accidents or uh, things like that or anything of that could involve the, the performance of the 509th. And uh, I guess one night uh, uh, a rancher, or some day I guess a rancher, had discovered the crash of uh, some debris on his ranch field, on his ranch there. And he got in touch with the uh, sheriff Chavez, uh, of Chavez County, who then got in uh, touch with uh, Colonel Blanchard, who was the base, intel uh, base commander. <clears throat> and it was uh, Colonel Blanchard who sent my dad out there uh, to pick up representative portions of the debris. And he did this, and it, as it turns out, our house was on the way back into the base. And uh, he stopped by to show my mother and myself uh, what the remains of what he called a flying saucer was. And uh, that's where I got into this thing. It was about 1 o'clock in the morning or thereabouts, and uh, he was really excited about having us look at this metallic debris. And uh, when I walked into the kitchen where he'd, where he'd uh, put this down, you know, it looked like there was just a lot of metal fragments, and I didn't know what it was, but uh, he described this as uh, being what he thought was parts of a flying saucer. And uh, so he said, look at this, because you'll never see this again, and he's right. You know, I did see this strange metallic debris with writing on the, uh, uh, some of the material, and, you know, that's where it started. Uh, and the, I've seen illustrations um, in the past, uh, people making artistic uh, depictions of what you described. Some of that almost, or, uh, you know, maybe the term hieroglyphic looking. Well, you know, my first impression was, you know, when I picked up one of these metal beams that had uh, some writing along the inside surface, I thought, well, this is hieroglyphic type uh, uh, symbols. And uh, But looking at it closer, it was not really hieroglyphic because there's no animals, you know, snakes or birds or things like that, rivers, whatever. But it's more like geometric symbols rather than hieroglyphic. And uh, it did have a very characteristic uh, color. It's kind of purple, violet hue, metallic in, in, uh, in nature. And, uh, but it wasn't hieroglyphic, but that was the first impression that this was hieroglyphic. But again, it was something very strange. And did you have the feeling <clears throat> then and or now that when you were looking at these geometric shapes that it was um, like language, that something was written there? Well, it looked like it was very purposeful. You know, something imprinted on the inside edge of this, like a it was uh, something to be read or deciphered, and uh, who knows what it meant, you know, but uh, uh, again, there was various geometry forms, uh, various configurations, and uh, it looked like a language. Mm -hmm. But what it said, who knows? Now, let's get back to Colonel Blanchard. Uh, he authorized a press release saying that the military had recovered a flying disc. Uh, yeah, apparently he did this to, uh, to uh, Captain Hout, or Lieutenant Hout, I guess, who was the public information officer at the base there, to release information that the Air Force had indeed captured or recovered a flying disc. And uh, that was to be released to the uh, uh, Roswell newspaper, and and that's where it got started with them. So uh, it was released from the air base first, and then later, of course, the, uh, they wanted a retraction on that because they realized that, hey, we don't want people to really know about this. Mm-hmm. Yet it seems awful strange that, you know, a colonel would make a public comment like that if he didn't have some kind of facts about what had been recovered. Yeah, well, he saw it, too, so he knew what he was talking about. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess what he did, he, he may have overstepped his bounds uh, uh, by saying, by going and releasing this, rather than letting higher headquarters make the uh, okay for the announcement of the uh, recovery. Well, then what happened? Well, your father was ordered to, to uh, investigate the scene or to recover the product. Tell us the rest of that story. Okay, what he did, uh, you know, he did uh, pick up representative portions of this. As a matter of fact, he was not by himself. He was with a, uh, a CSC agent uh, out there, and they both picked up portions of this thing. Uh, my dad put some in the back of the car, a 1942 Buick, and uh, CIC agent Cabot was his name, uh, had a carry-all out there, and I guess he put part of the wreckage in that. And, uh, of course, my dad stopped by the house. Cabot kept on to the base there. And uh, that's where Colonel Blanchard began, uh, got into this, and he saw what it was like. And then <clears throat> this stuff that wound up on a B-29 was taken to right field? 
All right, correct. You know what my dad, uh, what Colonel Blanchard did, he ordered uh, my dad to fly the material to uh, Air Force Base in, uh, in Fort Worth uh, so that Colonel, uh, or at least General Rainey could look at this because he was 8th Air Force commander at that time. Uh, so my dad, under armed guard, uh, brought portions of this debris to uh, uh, General Rainey's office there at Fort Worth. And it was, there were some pictures of, uh, of my dad holding some of the debris with General Rainey there. And uh, I looked at those pictures, and I had to laugh because those pictures were not the debris that uh, my dad had recovered. This was substituted for, uh, for the real stuff. What they did have, though, was uh, rep- uh, represent portions of a, of a weather balloon or, or mogul balloon, I guess, as it was. Uh, and not the real stuff. So that's when I when I saw this picture, I thought, well, obviously they, they changed this, they switched it. Mm-hmm. Well, then, uh, and then uh, at some point here, General Roger Ramey took over, right? Uh, yes. And I guess he uh, ordered uh, Blanchard to kill the story, uh, that this is not to be made for the public domain at this time. And my understanding is that some of the wreckage was flown to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio, where it may be there today. Mm-hmm. What do you think? Well, I think it was. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, uh, there's a, a C-54 that flew a lot of the wreckage to, uh, you know, from what I've been reading, and you know, I have no inside knowledge on this thing because I was not in the loop to know, but uh, that would be the logical place to to fly this to uh, uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, uh, where uh, foreign technology was being investigated, as they call it. Mm-hmm. Then what happened? Well, then, uh, you know, my dad you know, came back home after the uh, uh, scenario there in Fort Worth, and he sat my mother and myself down and says, you know, look, we can never talk about this again because it really didn't happen. In other words, he was told to go ahead and kill the story. And uh, since he knew that my mother and myself saw this, he wanted to make sure that we never divulged what we actually had seen there. Although I'm talking about it right now, but uh, but that, this is not, you know, my dad started talking about it in 1986, so I figured it's okay for me to start talking about it, too, since he already did. And, uh, Jesse, this is Nita. Yes. How are you? Good. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Stanton said to tell you hi. Well, good. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure we do that, because we told right. him we yeah. would. <laughs> Thanks. Appreciate that. <laughs> I have a question for you also. Um, I wanted Uh to know, uh, what is your dad's uh, qualifications to evaluate the crash site? Well, okay, he uh, was, of course, uh, part of the accident investigation team for aircraft, and he was an intelligence officer, and uh, as a matter of fact, he was on the faculty of the Air Force Intelligence School at Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. So uh, he was a logical one to to investigate this, uh, because he did have the training and the uh, knowledge to, to accomplish this. Uh, he went to radar school, so he realized what radar targets look like and what weather balloons were and mm-hmm. so forth. But his main uh, thing is he was uh, a graduate of the Air Force Intelligence School and actually was part of the faculty there. So he knew the difference between a weather balloon and... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it doesn't take much to, say, to uh, <laughs> see the differences there. <laughs> you know, a couple of years ago, in fact, it was about the time of the 60th anniversary of Roswell, maybe a little bit earlier than that. I talked to you. We also talked to you in McMinnville uh, at the festival there, and you had actually, you had actually re-enlisted or something, got activated again, and and you had gone to Iraq and were working over there as a doctor, right? Yeah. Well, you know what it is. You know, I, I retired retired from the National Guard in 1996 on my 60th birthday, but when <laughs> when they invaded Iraq in 1990, uh, 2003. I was called back up, you know, I was still within the age group to be called back up, so uh, I spent uh, 13 months in Iraq as a flight surgeon for uh, the 189th Attack Helicopter Battalion. So I got to see a lot of flying and uh, very interesting and very uh, exciting things out there, too. Some of it got to be almost too exciting, but uh, I finally got discharged finally in December of 2005. So, you know, I, was, I spent my 69th birthday in a helicopter out there in Iraq. Wow. <laughs> well, that, you see, you were 11, weren't you, in 1947? Yes, uh-huh. Yeah. Now, you mentioned something a moment ago, and I don't think I've ever asked you this question. Ago. Um, you said something about your mother started talking about the truth in this story at one point? Well, you know, uh, she was like a good housewife back in the 1940s. You know, she really didn't have a whole lot to say about that because my dad, and indeed, told us not to talk about this. So I never really heard my, son, my mother 
say a whole lot about this because you know it was pretty strong not to talk about it. Mm-hmm. She was a good, uh, good housewife, and my uh, dad was a good soldier. Well, she obviously well, talked to you uh, at times privately about it. Did she believe yeah. that whatever had happened there was extraterrestrial? Well, yeah, we all, you know, within our family group, we did talk about this. Mm-hmm. But even then, we didn't really go into it in great detail because mm-hmm. we all knew what it was. And uh, so why beat the thing to uh, beat a dead horse here? Because uh, we already knew what it was. And we did talk about, uh, uh, you know, the implications of extraterrestrial life being here. Uh, my family was not overly religious, but I, I was kind of more religious than they were. And it did kind of uh, uh, improve, at least caused me to believe in God even more because it made me realize how strong he was, how, how great he is to create not just us, but the whole universe. There's 10 to the 22nd power stars out there. And uh, if you want to count the number of grains of sand on planet Earth, you'll come up to 20, 10 to the 22nd power stars. And to say only one star out of all that multitude has life around it, or intelligent life, yeah, it's ludicrous. Now, uh, t- uh, how did you meet Stanton Friedman? You know, he <clears throat> he interviewed my dad in 1986, no, 1970, 1978, I think. Uh, and uh, it, we got, I was in the Navy at that time, and he got to communicate with me through my dad, and we got, you know, just started, you know, talking about the issues here. I was interviewed mm-hmm. for portions of a book. Uh, other people wrote books about this, too. Mm-hmm. Um, but speaking of books, family. speaking of books, what's the remind everybody what is the title of your new book? It's called Roswell Legacy, and it can be available through Amazon and uh, other uh, uh, sources. There, you know, I used to sell them over my uh, inter- over my website, but uh, I quit doing that because it's too much trouble to, to keep up with this. So, but they can they can get a copy through uh, Amazon. It's called Roswell Legacy. Roswell Legacy, yeah. and uh, it has a subtitle, It Really Happened. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what are some of the chapters in that book? Well, you know, basically I wanted to establish my dad's credibility, because, uh, you know, after he died in 1986, he, you know, his memory started getting a lot of flack from the uh, skeptics, because, you know, if you don't like the message, kill the messenger type thing. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to establish that my dad was who he was, an intelligence officer with uh, intelligence training and radar school training, so he knew what he was talking about to kind of put these uh, people back to rest there. Some of these guys wrote horrible things about him, and they're not good enough to lick the mud off his boots as far as I'm concerned. But uh, that's, that's another issue. But, but uh, I wrote the book really to establish his credibility, to give my portion of the story, what I thought it was, and, uh, you know, the meaning for mankind, really. You're a military man, too. Have you ever seen anything that matches the materials uh, that were recovered that day? You know, actually not. Uh, uh, although I've had uh, Bill Burns, who had this uh, program, UFO, uh, uh, about debris or whatever, and he had me and uh, one of the guys who picked up the debris, uh, one of the soldiers who picked up the debris off the field, come in and uh, individually look at various kind of foil. And, uh, and I saw this mylar, and that's pretty close to what I saw. And as it turns out, this uh, other soldier picked out the same material, a mylar, because uh, they, you know, that really identified itself as being close to what we saw. Mm-hmm. And uh, we did this separately. We did not uh, compare notes, you know. Yeah. I, I remember I was only going to say about Chuck Messler as he pointed out how the, the government story kept changing. You know, they first had provided one kind of excuse, then it was a weather balloon, then it was a dummy, yeah. then it was a mogul uh, balloon. Well, it's um, a, a hard place, sir. <laughs> Hey, yeah, and what is, what is the um, what basically was the government saying when they were saying that what happened there at Roswell was a mogul balloon? What's that theory about? Well, you know, they they changed the story from a weather balloon to a mogul balloon, and uh, the reason they did that is because you know a mogul balloon was a top secret device, and uh, its purpose was to uh, to hoist microphones up into the stratosphere to listen to for any possible sonic vibrations from a Soviet nuclear test. And the problem is that, uh, yeah, mogul balloons, were, their, their mission was top secret, but the material that they were made out of was mundane, off-the-shelf stuff, just like a weather balloon. So it, it's not the material that's classified, but it was the purpose, the mission that's classified. And they said, well, that's the reason we want to keep it under guard, under secret there, because uh, the mission. But, uh, but you know, 
A balloon is a balloon is a balloon. Mm -hmm. um, and and the other thing was like with the six foot tall dummies, but mortician Glenn Dennis, did, did he see six foot tall dummies? Uh, not to hear him describe. It. He said they were they were small. Um, uh, I guess they, he had a girlfriend who was a nurse there at the hospital uh, at Roswell, and she described these uh, the individual as a very small, short stature type uh, people with uh, large eyes and you know, a small nose, and uh, and uh, I guess you know obviously not uh, dummies like the uh, uh, crash dummies were. But I'm well, not sure he ever saw those, but uh, he heard his his girlfriend, the nurse, describe them. Mm -hmm. That what what he described sounded more like your your classic alien gray. Yes, and uh, uh, I guess he had gotten a call from the uh, somebody at the base hospital from the mortuary section out there to bring some small caskets in, some childlike caskets that would be uh, suitable for putting in small individuals. Mm -hmm. Not six oh. foot at all. Dummy. Yeah. And well, and you know, right now there's this. There's some more credible testimony. I think it's been recently from this. I'm trying to think of her name, but she's an elderly woman, a widow um, of uh, General Harry Nations Cordes, mm -hmm. and she's been speaking out lately, talking about how she always tried to get her husband to tell her what really happened there, and he never wanted to. Uh, and she said at one point she had bugged him so much that he looked at her, and he wasn't smiling when he said, "If I told you, I'd have to kill you." And then later, before he died, she said that what he really conveyed to her was that he didn't want to tell her because he did not want to um, challenge her world view. In other words, this information um, might have affected her psychologically to think that there could be intelligence beyond this world or something like that. But anyway, she's she's old enough now that I guess she figures, you know, what can you do to hurt me anyway? So now she's out there talking about uh about all that did you know uh did you know general uh cordis uh no i i did not as a matter of fact i know of him but i did not uh, ever meet him mm -hmm. and what about uh sheriff george wilcox did you know him you know again that's just what i've read in the papers I, I read about him but i've never met him um mm -hmm. you know because i was not really in the loop to to go i was just a kid you know right you know, at that time so i was not in the loop to know about all this Right. I just wondered, you know, as you got older, if you had the opportunity to ever meet any of those people. And and the interesting thing that I find about all of these people is that up and until this event and since, they all had solid reputations. Mm -hmm. They all had nothing to gain by making up some kind of a story if it didn't happen. And yeah. most of them realized that if they uh, admitted what they had saw, that these disinformation agents or whoever, like these people that attacked your dad, would do what they could to damage their reputations. And yet many of them, uh, as they got older in life and maybe got to, like this widow of uh, the generals, uh, got to where they started thinking, there's nothing you can do to hurt me now anyway. And so many of them have come forward to support that whatever happened at Roswell was what your father told you and what you have said, that this was extraterrestrial or otherworldly or something, but it certainly was not known craft or, you know, wasn't one of our experimental airplanes or something that went down. Yes, sir. Um, so, but anyway, she's the latest one out there, just another one, you know, that has come along who is saying that whatever uh, occurred there actually did, uh, it was extraterrestrial. Now, r remind me, who was the... Um, who was the farmer that found the debris in his field? Oh, it was Mac Brazel. He's a, a sheep rancher, and uh, he and his son were ranching out there on the Foster Ranch, which is about 75 miles northwest of uh, Roswell. And apparently that's, that's where the, uh, the disc or whatever it was came down. And uh, I have an interesting story about Bill Brazel, his son. Uh, they, they both went out there, and I guess Bill uh, Brazel put some of the debris in his saddlebags. And I guess it stayed there for some time. And I heard Bill talk about this over at his kitchen table uh, years later. And he talked about how he went to a bar in Socorro or Corona, New Mexico, got drunk and started talking about having some of this debris in a saddlebag. <laughs> and he said it wasn't long after that bar where a couple of well-dressed gentlemen came to the ranch door, knocked the door and said, we understand you have some Air Force property and we intend to get it. And he surrendered it without any questions. They made it known they were going to get it no matter what. Hmm. So we're not talking about a weather balloon or tin foil from a <laughs> whatever radar target. Uh, 
But uh, he, so he surrendered it. Well, and and his son uh, didn't his son uh, at first come into town was maybe willing to talk or something. And uh, somebody told me a story one time that um, uh, right away they took him in, they questioned with him, and then the next thing you know, he's driving around town in a brand new pickup and wasn't interested yeah. in talking. Yeah, that huh? was Mac Brazel. Uh, they, they think he was probably paid off not to talk about this, and uh, part of the money went to a new pickup truck, and uh, I guess he opened up a, a cold storage area uh, in another town, you know, close by there, which took a lot of money that uh, they knew he didn't have. But uh, he suddenly uh, started uh, showing all these things that cost a lot of money there, and they think that he was probably paid off to keep his, his silence about this. Yeah, but that's that's just conjecture. Who knows? Jesse, have you ever seen the movie Roswell? I have, yes. Were you and the other events portrayed in that movie uh, accurate? Well, you know, they used some poetic license, you know, but, uh, you know, like I never kept any of it like it was depicted in the movie. You know, they showed me uh, having a cigar box full of stuff under my bed. Well, no, I did not do that. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, the uh, material was put on the kitchen floor, not on the dining room table and so forth, but... Uh, but other than that, it was okay. And I guess the reunion that my dad went to for the 509th, uh, I had no knowledge that that happened. So I don't think it really happened. But they, you know, that was just part of the story. Mm-hmm. Well, them rascals, they do that. A few years ago in McMinnville, you told me a neat and interesting story about a trip to Washington where oh, yeah. you wound up in the dungeons of the Capitol. Tell us that story. <laughs> yeah, that was really interesting. You know, uh, you know, I was going to Washington to a to a UFO meeting, I believe it was. And uh, before I left there, uh, my secretary here in Helena got a call from uh, a gentleman uh, in the, in the uh, Capitol building saying he wanted to talk to me when I got here. Well, you know, to my knowledge, no one really knew I was going there. Uh, certainly not my secretary. You know, my secretary was the only one who got that, uh, knew I was going. But at any rate, uh, she, he, uh, he conveyed the message to her that I want to talk to Dr. Marcel now. And she said, well, no, you can't because he's busy. And he says, you tell him I want to talk to him right now. And so she got me, and as it turned out, it was a very nice gentleman uh, in Washington said that, something about, uh, I understand you saw some material in Roswell. And he says, when you get here for your meeting, I want to talk to you about this. So I flew into Washington to go to the meeting, and, and sure enough, there was a, a message on my phone uh, at the hotel where I checked in, and it was him, or at least a message from him. And uh, he wanted me to meet with him the next day at, uh, uh, I won't give the, num- the number of the room there, but uh, in- it was in the Capitol building uh, on the Senate side. And uh, he said, I want to talk to you, uh, get, and have you come in tomorrow morning around, you know, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I said, okay. And so I went over there, and, uh, and sure enough, you know, I checked in at the desk there, and I said, uh, I'm so-and-so, and I want to talk to so-and-so. And he said, oh, yes, we were expecting you. And uh, so he... You know, he came out and greeted me, very nice gentleman, and uh, we went down into uh, uh, the bowels of the Capitol building. As uh, yeah, he said, you know, uh, do you want to talk in a secure area? Just trying to recall back what our conversation was, but yeah, I said, you know, I don't need to talk to in a secure area because I'm gonna, not going to say anything I didn't say publicly already. He said, but I might tell you something, so we'll talk in a secure area. Mm-hmm. So we got in the elevator, went down, 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 about three stories down below the Capitol building floor and into this beautiful uh, uh, mahogany you know, panel uh, uh, meeting room for really high up, higher up ups. And uh, on the table was a, a book on Roswell, and he also had a yellow legal pad there for taking notes. So he sat at the head of the table, I sat at the, uh, uh, to his right, and he pointed to the name of the book, which is called Majestic, this is by Whitless Strieber. He said, this is not fiction. I said, you know, I know it's not fiction, but as it turns out, uh, Majestic is a fictionalized account of the Roswell event. But anyway, he said, this is not fiction, Roswell. really happened? I said, yes, sir, I know it did. And so we talked about what uh, what I saw, what I thought it was. And I asked him, you know, when are you guys going to tell people about what's really there? And he said, if it was up to him, they had done it yesterday, but it's not up to him that another group has in charge of this. And he said, you know, they're spending money illegally because uh, they're keeping this a secret which should not be kept secret, uh, and it's his job to find out who these people are, you know, and you know how much money they're spending, which you know, like I would know really. Uh, but anyway, that was his job, 
description was to investigate this group, which you call the black government, uh, which is spending money illegally to keep the Roswell event secret. Hmm. And uh, so I left. I was satisfied with the fact that, uh, hey, this guy, it's the first time I had somebody in the government actually tell me that uh, that this was a real thing. And he also asked me, uh, had I gotten any threatening phone calls, which I had not. Uh, he said, well, you know, if you do, he gave me his name and his number on, the, on this yellow paper. He said, if you ever get any threatening calls, let me know because he wants to investigate it. But, you know, I never did, so... It's funny how that you have these different factions that can be operating inside the government. Some of them are beyond congressional review. They've got these black budgets and black officers, and and uh, and then and of course I know who you're you're talking about. I think you don't like to say his name, and so I won't. And uh, he was an aide to a senator who I also know. And uh, so it's amazing that you get brought in, uh, you know, into the lower part of the of the Capitol building there, and have somebody tell you uh, this really did happen. <laughs> and uh, and if you get threatened, let us know because we're we're trying to investigate what mysterious forces are at work here that are trying to keep a lid. Uh, you, so you got one side there that are trying to push towards disclosure of of information, and another that's trying to keep a lid on it. Yeah, right. You know. Um... Well, anyway, I know that they're working on it, and you know, he described this group that has control as, as uh, the black government, you know, and blah blah. Is that they're uh, not elected, have unlimited funds, answer only on themselves. And uh, he said those are the people that they think have the debris right now. So it's not really under control of the military that we know about. But uh, but anyway, that's it, that's what it is. Jesse, I wanted to ask a couple more questions, if I could. Sure. Um, on the night that you, uh, your dad brought that debris in, um, mm-hmm. did that frighten you? Uh, did it scare your mom? I mean, what did you guys think when he came through the back door with all this strange debris scattering it all about and taking a look at it, telling everybody to be hush-hush about it? How did that make well, you feel? Well, it wasn't frightening or anything like that. It, was, you know, it uh, sure piqued my interest in this thing because my dad was very excited about this, uh, being, you know, like he said, you know, Thought it parts of a flying saucer, so uh, I wish that I got my interest. But uh, as far as uh, fear factor, no, there wasn't any. I was just more like a scientific interest. I want to see what the hell this stuff was like. And uh, you know, I said, you know, the first thing he did was tell us to look for any uh, electronic components like vacuum tubes, uh, resistors, condensers. But there wasn't anything like that. Although he already knew, because he just wanted me to satisfy my own curiosity about what was there and what was not there. Do you, uh, have you ever had any regrets about any, uh, what happened? Do I? Yeah, do you no. have any regrets about all of this exposure? No. You know, I, you know, I like to think that, uh, you know, the uh, you know, way life turns out, you're at the right place at the right time to see something that uh, very few other people have seen. And uh, so I take it as, as, uh, you know, as a game changer for me. You know, at, uh, Jesse, this is Joe. I have a question for you, and by the way, it's an honor to get to talk to you finally. Yeah, um, And I wanted to ask you, you know, you said something earlier about, you know, hopefully um, that the government will make the big announcement before your time is up. Mm-hmm. Um, are you talking about, you know, a, an official disclosure event? And, and if so, um, did I understand that, that you were actually looking forward to that event? Maybe that, Maybe that some of this information would finally become less guarded and maybe more in public view yeah i you know i would like to see it released before i go because uh you know i like to tell people hey i told you so <laughs> <laughs> a little vindication <laughs> I mean, that's right yeah i already know it but uh so it would not uh, add to my knowledge but it would just be confirming to others what i've already known for for many years now so yeah. uh, <laughs> i just like to say yeah i told you so yeah, well, if <clears throat> if one of those big Independence Day type crafts start hovering over the White House yeah. and a big speaker comes on that says we need to talk to Jesse Marcel, <laughs> you might say, hey, wait a minute, hang on, maybe this isn't so exciting. <laughs> that would be very interesting. <laughs> yes, it would. Very, very um, what do you make of some of the other stuff that came out of Roswell, like the majestic documents? Well, you know, um, boy, it's. That's what it is. I mean, if, if they if they can be confirmed to be uh, true, well, you know, school's over. It's, that says it exactly. And I know Stan is working on this, and uh, he feels they're genuine. And uh, and uh, there are a lot of things that make me feel that hey, they really are a document that's uh, authenticated. 
And but uh, taking at face value, it says what it is. Yeah, and uh, <clears throat> of course Stanton, he's he pretty much has done the definitive research on that in the, in years past. Wrote the books on it, and and also worked to separate those documents that were fake that had been inserted as kind of a disinformation tactic yeah. to then also bring down the credibility of the ones that he also probably has been able to illustrate were real. Okay. We've been talking to Colonel Jesse Marcel, Jr. He is, uh, man, he's, uh, historically he is in the mid middle of modern UFO studies, so was his dad. The name of his book is The Roswell Legacy. It did happen. Many others are saying the same thing now. Uh, Colonel Marcel, thank you so much for taking part in this uh, official disclosure special series. Well, Tom, thank you very much. It's been my pleasure. All right, this is Tom Horn, and this is the Raiders News Network. Thank you for joining us for this special edition of Raiders Live News Talk Radio. We'll continue in a moment. Don't go away. <laughs> 